Good evening. I'm Lonnie Stonich, the Executive Director of FAN, and I'm honored to welcome you to tonight's important conversation between the Most Reverend Michael Curry and the Right Reverend Jeffrey Lee. Thanks for attending. This present moment is suffused with tension and sadness, resolve, and hope. Tonight, we are privileged to create community in support of each other. Let's turn our minds and hearts to hope, love, and righteous action. FAN is a nonprofit organization that presents a high quality speaker series offered free to the public on a wide variety of topics, including human development, mental health, education, and social justice, among others. We have over 125 videos of past events archived on our website and on our YouTube channel for free public viewing. Please be sure to explore. And now for formal introductions. The Most Reverend Michael Bruce Curry was installed as the 27th presiding bishop and primate of the Episcopal Church in 2015. He is the chief pastor and serves as president and chief executive officer and as chair of the executive council of the Episcopal Church. He is the first African American to lead the denomination and is a strong advocate for many social justice causes, including immigration, same sex marriage and racial reconciliation. Bishop Curry has authored five books, including his latest, Love is the Way, Holding on to Hope in Troubling Times, published last year. He officiated at the 2018 funeral services of both former President George H.W. Bush and Senator John McCain, and delivered a stirring sermon viewed by millions at the 2018 wedding ceremony of Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. The Right Reverend Jeffrey D. Lee was the 12th Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Chicago, which includes 34,000 Episcopalians in 127 congregations across Northern and West Central Illinois. He was consecrated in 2008 and served the diocese through the end of 2020. He now serves the Episcopal Diocese of Milwaukee as provisional Bishop designee. It's now my pleasure to welcome to the screen for an incredible conversation, Bishop Curry and Bishop Lee. Thank you, Lonnie. It is a joy to be here with my bishop. Uh, and uh, really, Michael, I'm looking forward to this conversation uh, very much. It has been an eventful day. Yes. <laughs> it has been an eventful year. Yes. Several, it's been eventful. Um, and this morning, um, before we knew the outcome of the events unfolding mm -hmm. in uh, Minneapolis, you issued a statement uh, that I want to quote to you, uh, I want to quote you to you, but for those who may not have seen it, uh, among other things, you wrote this, when we weren't sure what was going to happen today. Mm -hmm. May we not be paralyzed by our pain, our fear, and our anger. May we learn, as the Bible teaches, to love not in word and speech, but in truth and in action, truth and action that leads to justice and healing. In some ways, I thought that's that's the that summarizes this book. Uh, Love is the way. Can you say uh, more about those words? They don't get put together very often. Uh, love, truth, and action. No, well, Jeff, thank you. It's wonderful to be with you and back at you. For those who don't know, I often jokingly say that. Bishop Lee uh, was my bishop as Bishop of Chicago since I was born there and my dad served as a priest there. And uh, uh, people often get us confused, um, it, it certainly happens. in the mail. It happens all the time. <laughs> it, it does. I, I have pictures of a toddler, Michael Curry, which I'm willing to show for the right price. On second thought, I'll be nice to you. <laughs> Thank you all for, uh, for having us. And um, it, it is a real uh, privilege. Um, you know, I suppose the word love doesn't get connected with the word um, with action mm -hmm. um, because we often think of love as an emotion. Mm -hmm. And and to be sure, there is the emo there is an emotional dimension, um, especially to romantic love. Um, there's no question about that. But but the kind of love that that this book is filled with, um, and that I'm really getting at, is the kind of love that gets exhibited, especially in scripture. 
um, in, in the Hebrew scriptures and the word hesed, God's steadfast love. It's a love that's like a rock. You can count on it. Um, you know, it's solid and it's going to be there. You know, it's solid. God's steadfast love. It is the steadfast love of God that leads the Israelites out of Egypt to freedom land. It's the steadfast love that causes prophet Amos to, to cry out, let justice roll down like a mighty. That's God's steadfast love. Jesus builds on that tradition, if you will, and all of his teachings about love are about a love that's not a sentiment, it's a commitment. It's a commitment to a life that seeks the good and the welfare and the well-being of others, as well as the self. I mean, it doesn't leave the self out, but seeks the good of others. It's unselfish love. It's sacrificial love. And that kind of love by nature is active. It, it leads one to do things that help the world and society and our lives look more like love and less like the opposite, which is really selfish self-centeredness. Or maybe even indifference, right? Indifference. Uh, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I don't care. Yeah. I, I'm glad to hear you talk about the, uh, uh, we, we have, we use the word almost always in popular speech to mean a, a certain kind of feeling, but mm -hmm. the kind of love you're talking about really has nothing to do with how we feel about the other person. No, no, it really doesn't. It's, it's, I mean, I, I, I haven't done the etymology of, of the words of the English lyrics, but much less in their Greek origins, but um, it's clear that there is a profound difference between loving and liking. Mm -hmm. uh, loving is a decision. It is a commitment. Um, again, I'm not talking about romantic love. That's a whole nother chemistry, so to speak. But, but this kind of love we're talking about is a commitment. It is a commitment to a way of being of unselfish living. It's not necessarily a commitment to like. Liking is almost a reaction. Uh, you may or may not like me. I may or may not like you. That's almost a, a, an instinctive reaction. Um, loving's not a reaction. Loving's a commitment. I'm going to love you. And, and maybe I'll like you. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Hopefully, you know, one would hope. But that's the decision. It's a commitment and it's an action. <laughs> And, and as a practice, right? You commit yourself to a practice of loving the other. And, and maybe is that, uh, if I understand you right, that's, that's where the power of, of love yes. uh, to address these long-term overarching issues. So one commentator I heard on the news today said, what has happened in this verdict is accountability perhaps, but it's not justice. That work is still before us. Right. And will be for a long time. And so the power of this of this commitment, yep, not 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 based on on the capricious feelings I may have at any given moment, right. but a, a decision. As you right. say. It is a, and a decision that's got to be renewed. Um, it's, it's got to be reaffirmed. Mm -hmm. it, it will have to be revived. There are times when you won't feel it and won't yeah. feel like it. And sometimes you just do it anyway. Um, you know, um, it is a it is a spiritual practice that leads to a way of life. Mm -hmm. um, and and it requires spiritual energy to maintain it. I mean, and, and it's not just our own energy. It sure. requires what were you you're about to say? Where, say? where does that energy come from? I, I, I got to tell you, I, I know from my own experience, um, th there used to be a hymn, and I can't remember which hymn it was. It probably was something like Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus that has that the verse that says, the arm of flesh will fail you. You dare not trust your own. Yeah. Uh, now, that could get a little bit exaggerated, but part of the wisdom there that I think is there is that by myself, I don't have the capacity to love consistently. Um, you know, I, I just don't. Um, I have some gifts and capacities. But if, if you hit me, my first instinct is not going to be, oh, how can I love Jeff? No, that's not going to be. It's going to be fight or flight. If I think, you know, I, I can take you, then maybe fight. If I think I can't, then it's flight. You know, it's a, that's just human beings. That's how we are. It's whether it's evolutionary biology, I don't know. And yet the decision to, to love is to stay in there and seek the greatest good that is possible in this relationship and in this moment. By myself, I don't have that capacity on my own. But um, Archbishop Tutu used to, used to say all the time of God's mission and God's work in the world, he said, by himself, God won't. By ourselves, we can't. But together with God, we can. And that's where the energy of love comes from. The source of love itself is 
God, who my Bible, last time I checked, First John chapter 4 says, God is love. Not, that's not Michael Curry. That's the Bible. Um, and so if God is love, God is the source and the energy of love. I love it. Christa Stendhal once said, the spirit of God is the energies of God's love, energies of God's love poured out over the world. So if I'm in partnership with that, in relationship and communion with God and God's energy, then what God and I together can do is more than I ever could do on my own. And that's not magic, is it, Michael? You spend a lot of time talking mm -hmm. about uh, the, 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 uh, the witness of uh, faithful people. Uh, you know, your grandmother, your father, yeah. the, uh, the, all the folks in the congregations you've served. Um, yeah. Say something about a community of practice, a community of love. Um, I mean, we would we would point to the church uh, mm -hmm. as flawed as it is, uh, yeah. but there are other kinds of communities. Can you say something about that? Um, how we know, how we know these things and experience them through other. You know, you you, you know it. <laughs> you know it when you see it. You know, there is some of that. I tell you, during this pandemic, as an example. Um, I've become, I'm, viv I've, I'm more aware or consciously aware of how much I, and I think we, really do need a relationship with God mm. and with each other. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that, that, that absence of one or either one something is deficient, something is left out. The sense of loneliness that, that has resulted from this pandemic because we've been isolated from each other of necessity. I mean, of necessity, we've had to do it to save lives, but boy, it comes at a high price. <laughs> and part of the reason is, you know, I'm not a rocket science. I'm just convinced we were made for God and each other. That's what we were made for, for God and each other. And we are only potentially at our best when we are in a loving, liberating, life-giving relationship with God and with each other. That's the formula for Michael thriving, for Jeffrey thriving, for us thriving together and as a community, as as what Dr. King often called a beloved community, um, where none are cast down, none are put down, where all are raised up and lifted by the power of love. That's community, in, it's powerful stuff. In all of our diversity, which, which is essential to anything worthy of being called community, right? Um, yeah. which, is, which is what makes uh, racism so blasphemous. Uh, the, the image yeah. of God is, is, the, is the whole of humanity, right? And all of its yes. diversity. Exactly. Uh, and so this is this is this is this is the work. <laughs> I mean, think how boring we'd be if we were all the same. Yeah. I mean, we'd be a blob. <laughs> Not humanity. It's a blob. There's nothing exciting about a blob. Um, I mean, the reality is we really hmm. God created us. You know, there's a that James um Weldon Johnson in his book God's Trombones in that yep. poem in the creation, the first one, and God stepped out on space. I'm lonely. <laughs> I'm lonely. I think I'll make me a world. That the insight there is not that God is neurotic and needs us uh, to handle his neurosis. No, it's that God is a God of relationship. That is, that's the, the God who is love will seek to love and create a world in which love is meant to be the norm by which we live. It's the way we have real life, not mere existence, but where real life becomes, which is a reason, you know, if you think about it, when you think about the times when you've known you've been loved, it feels good. And the times when you felt like you weren't, it feels horrible. <laughs> There's a reason for that. We were made to be loved. We were made to be loved. We were made to love. We were made created by the hand of love. God is love. That's, I mean, this is dynamic stuff. This is and that love is what you were talking about earlier. This is, this, God has made a decision to love us despite, of, despite ourselves. We've been, That's right. loved us into being not as a, as, as you say, kind of a neurotic need to be, mm. but it's the nature of God himself. Yes. Is to, is to create and, and place us in at least the possibility of loving one another, right? Yeah, yeah. it's extraordinary. 
Yeah, it's this. I don't believe I'd have done it that way if I were God, but that's a good thing. Um, you know, I'm not sure I'd, I'd have that much trust. Um, you know, I think in the New York Times yesterday, and this is to get back to some uh, current issues before us, I was stunned by this. In the New York Times, about the uh, in an article about the rise of political sectarianism, studies yeah. it reported have suggested that up to a third of American citizens believe that violence would be justified to achieve political ends. That's, 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 funny. that's the antithesis of what we're talking about and, uh, and, and what we're up against uh, on that long trajectory of, uh, of justice and uh, where love can flourish in its reality. Yeah. Uh, what do we, how, how do you, how do we stand in the face of that? And this is, this is your word hope, I think. Yeah. <laughs> It, this hope is on to hope that yeah. such a thing is possible in the light of those kind of numbers. I, well, I think we have to reclaim love's space. Mm. We have to reclaim the space for um, human virtue. Mm -hmm. um, mm. Reclaim the space for kindness. Mm. Reclaim the space for compassion. These are not weak. Um, um, kinds of realities. Um, reclaim the space for justice. Um, even if it's an ideal, elusive, what one toward which we strive. Reclaim the space for truth. Uh, one of the courses that I didn't really realize how valuable it was when I was in seminary, and I took it my last year. It was I was kind of filling space because I had to take a course. It was in philosophical theology called Vices and Virtues. I didn't even know what it was about before I took it. <laughs> Do you realize, Jeff, I've been living off of some of what, I mean, it was reading the classics. And, and what I realized was the wisdom there is they realized that human life Life becomes um, like the brutish beast. Yeah, yeah. Apart from that which ennobles us, mm. that that which gives a grandeur. What Psalm eight is talking about, uh, he has made them but a little lower than the angels. Um, mm. That that kind of noble grandeur. I mean, the noble grandeur that you see in a couple that's been married for yeah. years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw a picture of a couple. She had Alzheimer's or a dementia, didn't know who she was, didn't know who, he, who her husband was. Mm -hmm. And somebody asked him, well, why do you take her out for a walk every day and you spend all the time? He said, well, she doesn't know who I am, but I know who she is. Oh yeah, that's right. Oh, oh. Jeff, that's, <laughs> that is, I mean, you know what I mean? That, that, that's holy, <laughs> that's extraordinary. Yeah. That, that capacity for grandeurs, what things like love and, and, and just decency, human de human compassion and kindness, um, and a sense of justice. Um, and I'm not talking about you know moralism. <laughs> I'm talking about virtues that ennoble and lift up is the answer. Those are those are those are those are strong words, Michael. Uh, yes. Ennoble, uh, grandeur, as opposed to grandiosity, which we've had quite enough of. Mm -hmm. uh, we're washing it. Uh, yes. Right, uh, yes. the caricature of those things that are that are good and true and beautiful and worthy of uh, yes. thinking about, as Paul asks us to. Uh, oh, think. that's right. Uh, and well, where do we? How do we recover that? How, particularly, um, in a, you know, we claim to uh, mm -hmm. in in the Christian community. We God knows we do not always live up to it. Uh, where else can we find that? because we are increasingly in a world, in a society where the church has either been, has either been seen with justification to be damaging and not safe uh, mm -hmm. in many cases, uh, you know. And uh, so uh, Brian McLaren, the evangelical author says, if it's really good news we Christians are preaching, it has to be good news uh, for everybody, whether they believe it or not. Uh, yes. Right? And so yes. where else do we find that? Where, where do you find that? Where do you see that the the, the grandeur, uh, the, the the thing really worthy of being loved, being practiced? I do see, and, and it, 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 sometimes it feels like it's episodic and not ongoing. But I, I've seen it in human relationships, where human beings actually engage each other like they were brothers, sisters, siblings. Yeah. At our best, you know, we all have siblings and family, but I mean, you know what I mean? At our, <laughs> at I, do, our best. I do, I do. Right. I do. Yeah. But I, I've seen that. I've seen that um, in places where I didn't expect 
to see that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, this may not be the best example, but I remember when I was rector of St. James in Baltimore, uh, we had a, a dear woman uh, who lived not that not too far from the church. Anyway, she had she had trouble walking, and and for some reason she had, she was on the church van, and they, they dropped her off maybe a block. She, I'm sure she told them drop her off, mm. and dropped her off, and and the driver was kind of concerned because she lived in a fairly enough rough neighborhood, mm. and when she got off, there was a guy who looked pretty tough, helped her off the van, mm. and spoke to her. Yeah. And she walked down the street like a princess with her cane mm -hmm. and found out later that even the dealers watched out for her. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, you know, I mean, now, whatever else they did, I mean, I, I know, I mean, I, I'm not Shangri-La, mm -hmm. but there was, uh, you know, one brief shining moment, one brief moment there, the grandeur of humanity was mm -hmm. shining through them. Um, she elicited something out of them. Um, and, and they watched out for her. Um, and she baked them cookies too, but well, that didn't hurt. <laughs> which, which, which helps. You, re, you remind me of the story of the transfiguration. Uh, uh, you know, suddenly this, this, this Jesus up there on a the mountaintop, uh, they'd been traipsing around, uh, you know, the Palestine together, but suddenly something was pulled back. Mm. That still happens, doesn't it? it does. The it revelation does. of you know, the glory of God that's embedded in us, right? It does. I mean, and it, I mean, it does, you know, I mean, I mean, the, the, we will, somebody, I remember reading, um, um, it was an article or it was actually a speech that um, the head of one of the conservatories, and I can't remember which one, um, would, would give to the freshman class of the new students. And, and he was talking about why you practice, um, um, why you spend all the hours and the agony. And he went back to 9-11, which had just been, this was maybe a couple of years after 9-11. And he said the signs of life again in that city occurred when the symphony played mm, mm. and people actually sang mm. God bless America, whatever it was. He was saying it was, in the, it was when they sang again Mm -hmm. that people were beginning to live in mm -hmm. or claiming life. Mm -hmm. see I, mean? I mean, it's 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 like Churchill at the end of um, the Second World War said, now ring the church bells. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? It's something, it's that that that, they're, they're, that the arts, I mean, you know, I mean, I'm not a talented person, but I know there are times when as much of an Episcopalian as I am, my Baptist grandmother um, comes out of me, her spirit is on me. And thank thank I, God, oh my goodness. Oh God. God. <laughs> I know, but my father, who is a classic Episcopalian, um, would say, would you quit acting like your grandparents? Would you, would you just calm down? But I tell you, there's some times when, uh, I mean, I was at a Yo-Yo Ma concert. I wanted to shout. I wanted to get up and shout glory, hallelujah. Because there, there was something that touched something deep yeah. that was lifting me. That happens. It happens in life. It happens in relationships. It ha The arts can really bring it out. I mean, it really, I mean, there are times when it just happened. It, 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 now I wouldn't, I probably shouldn't link the arts with the Buffalo Bills, <laughs> but Go for uh, it. I, I'm all ears. Talk me. But there, there are moments when teams that have been down so long <laughs> and they I'm rise up. Come to mind, but go ahead. I'm yeah, I won't name any, but there may be some near you. You may be aware of some. Uh, <laughs> that there is something that I've seen cities lift up mm. from, um, you know, Baltimore when I was there. Oh, my Lord, when the Ravens won. It, it was like everybody put down their swords and shields down by the riverside and studied war, at least not for a few hours, you know? <laughs> well, you make me wonder about uh, uh, street art in places like Chicago and Milwaukee and Baltimore. In, in, in the most underserved, most at-risk neighborhoods, often this, this stunning art yes. emerges, right? Yeah. Um, and one wonders uh, what what the what where the energy for that comes from yes. in bleak bleak surroundings. You'll have these riotous color oh. murals and stuff. Yeah, oh. I want to I want to ask you a, a question about um, uh, current events. Uh, and mm -hmm. you've spent so much of your life in your ministry um, engaged uh, in in the struggle for racial justice mm -hmm. uh, and healing. Uh, of those of those divisions have been central uh, to your life and ministry. Thank God for it. Um, 
You know, I heard of all people, Condoleezza Rice say once in a uh, in an interview that she she regarded racism as the original birth defect of this country. Yeah. And she said, like birth defects, it's permanent, but we don't have to be defined by it. Mm -hmm. Why do you think this particular issue, racial justice, uh, healing of uh, its wounds, is, the, is a kind of a, an iconic or central or an organizing uh, task or a dominant task in and among all the other things that are challenging us? How is it related? It's intertwined with everything, it seems. It, it, yeah. I, I can't speak for other countries and cultures, mm -hmm. but I do, no matter how you cut it or read American history, mm -hmm. um, from the very beginning of the forced removal of the indigenous people of Native Americans from the land, and what really was genocide <laughs> over spread out over time, but it was. Yeah. Um, I mean, that, that was at our beginnings. I mean, it was actually the beginnings of conquest. Um, and, and so you have that at the very beginnings. It, this is originating DNA. Mm. <laughs> to her point. Yep, and then yep. you add chattel slavery from of, of Africans. Yep. Um, you have that. You, you know, had indentured servitude coming from, I mean, so you have in the origins of, of this country, which has the potential for greatness in spite of this, but in the origins, originating DNA, that is early corruption. <laughs> if the genes have been corrupted early, it's going to be take a lot of work. Yep. It's going to take a lot. Now, I, I like her. I, I think this is original sin. This is America's original sin, mm -hmm. which is exactly what she was getting at. Just like so. shift it to a theologian. That's what it is. And the reality is original sin means it's ubiquitous. It's around. Uh, don't be naive about it. It's deep. And yet you need not be slaves to it. A la Paul and Romans. <laughs> um, those who um, are slaves, those who love sin, they're slaves to sin. Uh, but if you love something greater than sin <laughs> and fixate on that, you can rise above it. You'll never completely get rid of it because <laughs> it's that deep. It's deep in the waters. Um, and I think that is true of racism. I, I mean, I really do believe that the beloved, that intimations of the beloved community are possible in this world. Um, not the fullness. It's, it's. I mean, when Josiah Royce started writing about the beloved community, I mean, he was yep. trying to find language to capture what Jesus in the New Testament is talking about when it talks about the kingdom of God or the reign, there is a kingdom of heaven. And he was talking about that kingdom in which love rules and all are loved. And if all are loved, there's room, plenty good room for all God's children. Oh, and when that, when that happens, it's a great, you know, I was going to get that in there, but I had to slip it in. <laughs> I was waiting. I was waiting. <laughs> but yeah, but that beloved community, we'll never get the fullness of it. But if we get an approximation of it, if we get something close to it, we will be better off than, than we are now. Um, and I really do believe that if Royce was right, that when Jesus talked about the kingdom of God, the reign of God, um, uh, the kingdom of heaven and all that, they really was talking about what Royce called the beloved community what King called the beloved community. If that's true, we pray for it all the time. Jesus taught his disciples to pray, thy kingdom come, where thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That our task, and I think Jesus was saying, as, as Frederick Douglass said, pray not only with your lips, but with your feet. Um, <laughs> pray with your life. Um, now, uh, act. Back to the, you know, uh, uh, back to acting, yes. back to acting, action and truth, truth telling. Yes. The, the, I mean, uh, the easiest way to kill what? Hmm. To kill that is is to deny it, uh, to pretend it doesn't exist, uh, to turn away. I mean, the 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 refrain I hear uh, and and feel myself. I know where it comes from. Well, I'm not a racist. That's missing the point. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I find myself. You know, it's. We're human. I mean, we, we, we are human. And, and, and racism is, it really is the original sin, the, 
uh, Condoleezza Rice's language, it is like, I had a bishop, one of our uh, bishops, one of your colleagues say to me, because about a month ago we were talking about this. And he said, you know, it is like being a spider or being caught in the spider's web. Mm. You can't get out. The more you try to get out, the more tangled up you get in. I mean, that's really true. I just, the last week I said to our executive council, I said, you know, we've got to move to what the insight that truth and reconciliation was getting at. We need to move it to truth racial healing and transformation. But we need, we've got, there's some stories even in our beloved church that have not been told. And, and as presiding bishop, I've begun to hear some of them. And I've begun to realize that we have legacies that none of us created, but that we're stuck in. Um, I mean, America's relationship with Latin and South America and how that gives, I, I said to the council, here I am a black guy and I'm overseeing an institution that inadvertently continues to perpetuate American imperialism in Latin and South America. I mean, nobody's nobody now is intending to do that. We're stuck in a web. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. That's about that spider web. And, and the thing is, uh, it drains, uh, mixing metaphors, but the, it drains the life out of everybody. It drains everybody. the life out of the perpetrators. It drains life out of God knows the victims. It, it, it drains the life out of everybody. I guarantee you, Jeff, I guarantee you, I don't know who the jurors were hmm. um, today, um, but I dare say they left feeling lighter. I, I pray that they true. believe they did what was right and good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I, and and yeah. that didn't matter what race they were. Mm -hmm. Didn't matter. I mean, I, we don't know who they were. Yet, I don't think we don't know who that. I gather we will at some point. Yeah, yeah. They they did. There's there's a reason for feeling righter, and it's not feeling happy or joyful. I don't know what the right word is. It's just feeling like yes, freedom. Unbind him and let him go. Uh, oh. Another image, right? Yeah. Yes, that's it. That's it. For the, those of you who may not know, I'm, I'm, I don't mean to speak in code, but there's a story about Jesus uh, uh, weeping at the tomb of his friend Lazarus and calls Lazarus out of the tomb and uh, these powerful words uh, tells the bystanders, unbind him and let him go. Go, oh, yeah. yes. Yeah. That's the let him, I'm, I'm weak. We don't have to be, we do not have to live as victims of fate mm -hmm. unless we do nothing. Mm -hmm. But as people of faith, mm -hmm. we can act and be set free. Mm -hmm. Um, like that old song, I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow and I know he watches me. That's my grandma again. But anyway, she slips in there all the time. She's there. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and it, so it's this, it's, it, there's a, there's a dynamic, right? Or a tension between the, um, is it some, some blessed saint of the church, uh, Augustine, I think it was said, uh, uh, pray like everything depends on God, work like everything depends on you. Yes. Uh, this is not something we can make happen by our own cleverness, our own power, our own, you know, uh, we're not let off the hook from doing those things. Right. But a frank, this, maybe that's the difference between grandiosity and grandeur, maybe. Oh. Grandiosity yeah. means, I look what I, look what I pulled <laughs> off. Yeah, yeah, it's me. It's me. Yeah. And that really is the original sin, isn't it? In yes. the biblical story. Yep. It really is. Yes. Yeah. The, I, I ate that tree you told me not to eat of, so I know stuff now. That's right. Now I know, <laughs> yeah, I know stuff now. Watch <laughs> so what you gonna tell me? Right. <laughs> yeah, that that's really it. I mean, it Dr. King called it the reverse Copernican revolution. Yeah, I, where I, I, I am the center before. of the universe. You know, I mean I just love that image. That that's that's what original sin is. That's the originating sin. That that's it's you know, and love mm. is the opposite of that. It seeks the good and the welfare and the well-being of others. I've, I, I've in the last year or so, I found myself um, in environmental conversations going back to John three sixteen. Yeah. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten. And that word "world" is cosmos, and it's the Greek word cosmos, which is not just this physical planet or this fragile Earth, our island home. I mean, it's not just this little planet. Yeah, yeah. It is everything that is seen and unseen, mm -hmm. um, the cosmos, everything. God so loved the cosmos that he gave his own. Listen to the language. He gave. He didn't take. 
he didn't he, he didn't exploit it for what he could get out of it. He gave his son. I mean, that is stunning. It is. Yes. But there's a there's a a German theologian I love uh, who says it's just it's just breathtaking. He says God. His definition of God is really this. He says God becomes God by giving God's self away. away. That that's the very nature of God is this self constant pouring pouring out of uh, yes. of being right uh, from yes. non being, um, which is going to happen with us or without us. I think that's one of the things that that's a healthy antidote to the, mm -hmm. to the grandiosity, at least among a lot of religious people. You know, salvation does not depend on on us. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's gonna have God is God, and we are not. That's right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Thank God. Thank God. <laughs> yeah. Uh, at least in my case, I can say thank God that uh, I'm not God. Um, I know that much. Um, I bet you'd be a good one. You'd be a good. <laughs> thank you, Mike. I appreciate it. Um, what do you say to folks? What do we have to say to folks who are not overtly religious? Uh, in some cases, for very good reason. Um, when uh, you talk so you write so beautifully about the power of religious ritual, spiritual practices, mm -hmm. ritual as things we are doing uh, not for their own sake, but because they create space for an encounter with the other, with the divine even. What do we, what do we have to say, especially in the light of uh, the Reclaiming Jesus Project, when so much of traditional faith language has been hijacked? It's been hijacked. It, it just, it has it's been yeah. hijacked. There's just no question about that. I, so how to... <laughs> You know, I, I'm, I'm, and I mean, this isn't new for, I mean, for anybody, but I'm one of the, I, well, some years ago, I went on a sabbatical when I was Bishop of North Carolina and, you know, had three months off after I'd been there about five or six years. And, and, um, I did a couple of things. One, I wanted to study the Sermon on the Mount and, and dig deeper into Matthew five, six, and seven and dig deeper in it. And then two, I wanted to do that in pair, in tandem with reading the writings of abolitionists. Um, those who Christians who argued for the maintenance of of chattel slavery in America and those who argued for its abolition for for its end, primarily in the U.S. I looked at some of the English ones, but primarily in the U.S. And I found an interesting pattern that those who argued for the maintenance of of slavery in the Americas, I mean, in, in America, consistently when they went to the Bible, avoided Jesus and the Gospels like the plague. The, I mean, I mean, it's, it is amazing. It's like they get to the New Testament and turn to do everything. They jump to Pauline epistles. They don't mess with the, the hardcore Paul. They just jump to slaves be obedient to them that are your earthly masters. I mean, which is which is really actually perverting Paul. But nonetheless, they go there because at least they found language they could play with. Um, they do not mess with Jesus. And and the, the abolitionists run to Jesus. I mean, it's like they run to him. They yeah. run to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. They run to the parable of the Good Samaritan, um, um, who is my neighbor, to whom am my neighbor. They run to Jesus. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. They run to Jesus. Uh, woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. You tithe mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. These, you, you know, I mean, they run to Jesus because they see in this Jesus, they knew he would set free. Frederick Douglass, actually, I think I read an excerpt from Frederick Douglass's autobiography to the bishops about a couple of months ago, um, where he, he says the Christianity of this land ought not to even be called Christianity. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is slave stealing. It is women beating. It is family disrupting. It is violent. It is this. He says the Christianity of Christ. That is Christianity. The Christianity of this land has nothing to do with Jesus the Christ. And, and it's just as, I mean, Gandhi said a similar kind of thing. Yeah, he said, I like this Christianity if it weren't for all those steeples out there. Oh, those steeples. Yeah, it's that, true. Yeah, that India didn't need any more sources of division. <laughs> no, yeah. exactly. And so, I mean, I think really, I, I'm beginning to say, you know something? Take a look at the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth, both his words and how he lived that out. And you're just stay there for a while. Yeah, you're consistent about that in your call to us to 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 do just that, Michael. There's um, something there, Jeff. I, and, uh, it's, I'm very grateful for it. And that for for whether someone becomes a you know a Christian believer or not, Jesus commands respect. Yeah. Not as we paint him, <laughs> you know what I mean, or as he. But there is something about and. I found for friends of mine who are who are not, 
I mean, you know, who most of them grew up in church in some way, shape, manner, form, but no. a couple have made a conscious decision not to be the church that they're talking about or the religion they're talking about has been excised of the teachings and the spirit of Jesus. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and that's actually not the church I'm a part of. No, no. Actually. Yeah, um, no. Um, what was I going to say? Uh, that what happened in 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 the life and death and resurrection of Jesus is so uh, reality changing. We're still trying to come to terms with it. Yes. Not, right. It's it's this oh, unfolding yes. of just what hit us in in God made flesh. Uh, yes. Like you know, here I am. I'm 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 I'm. <laughs> you're gonna have to. You're gonna have to uh, figure this out. And yeah. it, we're still we're still doing it. We're still doing it. Yeah. You know, it's like the, like the spiritual director said. Why don't you just sit? As spiritual director would often say, "Why don't you just sit with this for a while?" Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes you know, don't try to fit, just just. Yep. Sit with it. Let it sit with you, you know? Mm -hmm. And I heard members of the family of, of George Floyd's family today. I was yep. watching some of the, yep. um, on, on, I think it was on CNN, and and um, several of them just kept saying over and over, thank you, Jesus. Mm. And th thank you, Jesus. And I know yeah. that they would have called on that same Jesus had the verdict gone the other way. I believe that's true. You know, it, it wouldn't have stopped because, the, and, and they might not have been able to explain it. There's something about knowing that we're part of a long-term struggle mm. of God's God's intention, that, that hymn that says, redeem God's lost creator, <laughs> um, um, to redeem a world that sometimes is bent on destroying itself, to save it from that um, for life. I think that's one of the ways I talk about salvation, that God decided to come in relationship with us to keep us from committing suicide. Yes. Uh, yes. Oh, my gosh. That's right. We're bent on it. We're bent on it. How to explain, Michael, how to explain those, those blessed uh, souls, powerful people at Mother Emanuel, how to explain the Amish uh, uh, parents who, who were able to, to say a word of forgiveness in the light of atrocity, how to explain that? Uh, that's a power, that's not, that's not a power, that's not a power I have in my mind. I don't have that power. Yeah. Uh, God can help me get there maybe, or get as close as I can get, or help me along the way, but I don't have that power in me. I know that. Uh, no, no, no. But to be in relationship with, with such a God, yes, impossible things become possible. Yes, sir. Impossible things yes, sir. Like my grandma used to say, what an awesome God we got. I, I, one time I was in oh, I was in seminary, actually, and I went to see my grandmother and and her best friend was, uh, we used to call her Aunt Clara. But the two of them had canes and they were, you know, Aunt Clara was a Methodist, grandma was a Baptist. And they were always fussing about that. But anyway, so the two of them wanted to go shopping. So I took them shopping and you know, got them in the car and, and we drove and uh, we I couldn't park. I couldn't get around on the other side of the street where the store was. So we were going to have to park where I got a spot um because i couldn't even parallel there was just no way to do it so i figured right, i'm gonna walk them so i had one on each arm the two of them and so we crossed the street and we finally get to the other side of the street and there was a to get up to the sidewalk you had to step up now these are two like women they were well into their 80s probably pushing 90 by that time i could feel the pressure on my arms as they're working to get up and they got up on the curb and one of them said to the other uh, it was actually Aunt Clara because she used to call my grandmother Stray, Strayhorn. She said, Stray, we got a good God, don't we? <sighs> Jeff, I said, oh, my God, yeah. to see God in a footstep. Yeah. Yeah. That is, <laughs> I said, boy, these sisters got something I want to get. Well, <laughs> yeah. what's the, what's the, you quote your grandmother uh, in the book, We Got By. We got by. We may do. That's right. We may do. That's we it. May we do. may do. Yep. She said it all the time. May do. And that's more than just, well, we somehow managed another day. It, I, it, as you describe it, it's an act of improbable thanksgiving and and, and deep joy. Yes. And it's, it's creating, it's taking the mess you get and making something creative and impossible mm -hmm. out of it. It is just, um, 
it's glory to God whose power working within us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. That's what that is. It's taking the mess you get and working it and and doing something else. And I, I mean, the image of my, in the book is watching her cook in the kitchen. I love that. I love that image, oh. by the way. And 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 the whole uh, evolution of soul food. Of soul food, <laughs> yes. And of, uh, you know, uh, make and do with what you got. It's make and do, yeah. And turning it into something extraordinary. That's oh. a, that's a, that'll preach. That's a beautiful. It, it will preach, brother. It will. <laughs> it's, beautiful, isn't it? Oh. So I, I I can't resist doing this, and I know Lonnie's just reappeared. But oh, did she? Oh, did she? I was thinking about uh, as I was watching snippets of Prince Philip's funeral. Uh -huh. I, I was thinking about uh, uh, how love will not be uh, denied, will not be swept away. Uh, there you were preaching, wowing the world with that sermon, uh, oh. and and breaking all kinds of royal conventions uh, of the way things must be done at St. George's Chapel. Yes. At, Prince's, at Prince Philip's funeral, all the royal conventions were firmly back in place. Thank you very much. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Of course. But the theme was unmistakable. It, yes. was, it was love. It was love. And I, I, I couldn't help but think, and I wanted to ask you, what, what was going through your mind when you were watching that funeral? <laughs> you know, it was, well, at first I couldn't see her mad. I mean, I kept looking, it was hard to see her. Yeah. It was dark in the, in the pews where she was sitting. Mm -hmm. um, and then I remember at one point actually spotting her. Mm -hmm. And I saw her sitting by herself. Yes. Yeah. And I realized she hurts because she loves. Yeah, that's it. That, that's, that's, I said, oh my God. Yeah. I mean, that, wow. It was just, that was a, a moment of grandeur. Mm. And it wasn't the tiara. Beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you. That was, man. Michael, your advice often to many of us is you be you. Uh, it shows up in the book. Um, I just want to thank you for being you and for bringing your whole self to the work uh, that God's given you to do. Thank you for tonight. And uh, thank I'm, you, dear I'm, friend. I am proud and, and uh, delighted and deeply thankful that you're my bishop. And I to be in to have you as mine. Thank you. And my brother. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. You betcha. Uh, both of you, thank you so much for such a, a, a lovely conversation. I know people are very, very grateful to be hearing from both of you tonight. So many great observations. I was grabbing some notes about when you were talking about reclaiming the space and uh, the, mm -hmm. the series of nouns that you gave, reclaim the space for justice, for compassion, for truth, for, com for kindness. Um, you know, those are themes that many of our speakers from many walks of life um, echo so i was mm -hmm. i was really happy to see that uh let's get to a couple questions here because i know we are on the clock here oh, uh, just for those uh, who are maybe arriving late uh we are canceling the after hours event bishop curry is going to be doing a live stream with the episcopal church of minnesota beginning at uh nine o'clock there uh, 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 i mean uh, I nine sorry. eastern uh, yeah. eight central, eight central. <laughs> yeah. yeah you know whichever way that goes but yeah so in other words we're going to be canceling what had been an eight o'clock after hours so if you are late to that news that news is now that news uh so let's hop right in and we'll look in the questions so molly asks uh can you love without forgiveness or do you need to forgive before you can fully commit to love well i i I don't know how the sequencing really works out in real life. What I do know is that um, Jeff used the language, practice love. Mm -hmm. Practice. Sometimes you have to practice something until the practice of it becomes part of your being. That you can't necessarily think yourself into it. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you have to be conscious and aware, and I know all of that. But um, I'm just aware of spiritual practices. Somebody said to me the other day, that spiritual practices are practicing for something. Mm. <laughs> They're practicing for life. They're practicing us into living. It's not that you pray and then automatically you learn how to pray as you're doing your work. No, it spills over in time. It's a habit that becomes a habit of grace. It becomes a part of the habit of your life that just sort of 
it just sort of seeps in like water in your basement. It just sort of starts sneaking in different ways. And I, and I think that's with the practice of love, the practice um, of kindness, the practice. I mean, I think all of these are ways of talking about the, 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 the hospitality of God living through us and letting that over time maybe help me to forgive. And maybe to help me to do it before I even realize that's what I've done. And, and Michael, wouldn't you say too that like love, like the other the way we've been talking about it, forgiveness is is not not a feeling. It's no, a decision too. It's a decision to put down carrying around somebody else's stuff. Yeah, <laughs> don't you think? I'm gonna put it down. Now I may feel may angry. That that's gonna, you know, that kind of feelings come and go. <laughs> they are what they are. Yep. But I can decide I'm going to work at love. I'm going to, or I'm going to, I'm going to love, not work at it. I'm going to uh, do a little bit of dealer's choice here because Christopher Powell, who is at Christ Church Winneka, which is a new partner of FAN, and he's been lovely. He's the one who connected me with uh, Jeff to do this interview. So I'm going to oh, wow. get the, the last question here too, because I think we probably only have time for one more. Uh, we'll go to Christopher Powell, and he asks, uh, Bishop Curry, this, and because I also think this might be a slightly longer answer. Uh, Bishop Curry, the story of your father becoming an Episcopalian during his first church service with your mother seems to be an excellent example of talking love and making it an action. Mm. Could you share the story with the group? Oh, uh, Jeff knows this story. Oh, yeah. I love uh, this. Oh, story. yeah. This is the best. <laughs> it's all right. Tell Jeff, the story. Well, it's and 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 my sister and I used to dread hearing my father tell it because he would tell it all the time. But when you're kids, that's what you do. He he was um, well. Both of my parents grew up Baptist, um, mm -hmm. and my mother became an Episcopalian at some point. She was at the University of Chicago doing math and. I, I don't, I don't, I've never known the full story of, but anyway, she became an Episcopalian in Chicago. That's why I say Bishop Lee's been my bishop for years. Um, and so she ended up, she was teaching at Wilberforce, uh, one of our HBCUs in Ohio. Daddy was there, he had gone there undergrad and he was staying, he was there at the seminary for the Payne Divinity School. Um, and he was Baptist, but um, he was studying at the Divinity School. Somehow he met my mother. I don't know how that happened. Anyway they met and started dating and she was an Episcopalian and she went to church and she invited him to church. That's all. It, I mean, she just invited him, you know, would you like to come to church with me? Um, and so he went, he had never been in an Episcopal church. I don't even know if he had ever heard the word Episcopal or Episcopalian. I'm not sure about that because his daddy was a Baptist preacher too. So I don't know what he knew and what she had told him, but she went, well, this is late forties, 47 ish. 48, 1948, uh, it was right after the war. So you're in Southern Ohio, um, which which is, I mean, we used to joke when I lived in Cincinnati that this was upper Kentucky. Um, you know, so you're in Southern Ohio in the late 40s. Um, and, you know, he had never been in a church that was predominantly white. Um, and mommy was, and there may have been, if there were other blacks in the congregation, I don't know, but she was one of the few if she was. And my mother was dark skinned, so you would not, there was no question that she was black. I mean, you would know for sure. So he kind of looked around and said, well, this is interesting. And um, and so the service went on. You got to remember, this is the old prayer book, the 1928 prayer book. And the priest, you know, um, when it came time for communion, the priest was the only one who administered communion in those days. Um, they didn't have Eucharist administered back then. And so, um, you know, the priest came around and daddy was watching, you know, to see when mommy went up to receive communion. He didn't receive because at that point, remember, in those days, you had to be a baptized and confirmed Episcopalian and all that kind of stuff. So he stayed in the pew and watched. And he saw she was the only black person at the rail. Well, the priest came by, you know, gave the bread, the body of our Lord Jesus Christ given for thee, preserve thy body and soul unto everlasting life, take and eat this and he would go. And then he got to my mother and he gave her the bread and then he went to the next person and on and on and on. No problem. Then it came for the cup, the common cup. And he saw them drinking out of everybody drinking out of this one cup. And he said he was watching to see when the cup came to mommy. Okay, well, she drank after whoever was there in front of her, who was probably white, I guess. She drank, no big deal. But then he looked to see what the next person, the priest just kept going, the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ shed for thee that body and soul it kept on going and nothing else happened and he said uh he would say 
many have already told that story. Any church where blacks and whites drink from the same cup know something about the gospel that I want to be a part of. Yeah. That's how my father decided, made a decision, as we were saying, Jeff, um, to become an Episcopalian. And eventually he became an Episcopal priest. Wow. A Beretta wearing Anglo-Catholic Episcopal oh, priest. He, he, he went all he the way. On. He went, he was in. Yeah. He was totally. He really in. did. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, that's how. Story. Right? That's and he spent most story. of his ministry in ministry of justice and reconciliation and civil rights all the the years. Um, I, I wish he could have seen the, the 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 decision today because in the 1960s, he used to do human relations training with police officers trying to de-escalate violence and get racial sensitivity. And he said he was beating his head against the wall. Yeah. Um, and what happened today would never have happened then. Um, that that a police officer was held accountable for taking a human life, and um, yeah, sadly, it might not have even happened a year ago. You know, not no, just might not have. No, it took so people that's, marching uh, and singing. We'll, and... we'll we'll take the um. We had a speaker, Nancy Kane, a historian from Harvard, who hmm. uses a phrase that I like quite a bit, and she talks about rolling the boulder of goodness forward, hmm. and hmm. Um, it is really. Yes. Today, maybe there's a, a little turn on that boulder. Mm -hmm. So um, I want to thank both of you gentlemen for your time and your energy tonight, especially on such a busy night for both of you. We're very grateful. Um, thank you, Christopher Paul, for pointing us to the fabulous Bishop Lee. We're so glad to have had our acquaintance with you and wish you known. <laughs> as <it's> known. <laughs> um, and thank you everyone for tuning in um, and hopefully we'll see some of you on Thursday night for our next program thank you Bishop Curry so much uh, we're, we're big fans of you thank you so much God Bonnie, thank, you. thank you for the work of the organization and, uh, uh, and your leadership thank you yes. oh thank you so much appreciate that thank you all right be safe everyone thank you good night thank you.